Hello. Hello. Okay. <laughs> uh, alrighty. Um, I'm a little bit confused with what screen I'm gonna have to share. Well, let me share the screen first. Can you see um the Google slide page? Oops. Okay. All righty. Um, let me get this out of the way. <laughs> okay, so um, so this officially, you know, we're gonna start the class. And um let me like ask you, what do you interpret uh, from seeing this photo, first of all? <laughs> okay. What else? Stacking the bricks, okay. What else? Well, we'll take about, uh, well, let's say like a minute for you to join in this um, a mini activity, seeing the photo and <laughs> interpret what you think from the photo. It's actually related to the class. Uh, structure. Yeah, sure. Like there's no right or wrong answer here. Just wanna let your imagination, you know, fly. Okay, building blocks. All right, I'm sharing this, uh, my video too. Okay, does anyone like have any other opinion for this photo? <laughs> okay sure who who else has like different opinion no more i mean guys we have 60 62 people so technically 60 61 because i exclude myself how many comments that we have so far? One, two, three, four, five. Only five comments, come on. Or you can open the mic if you want to. <laughs> I'm currently um, showing them the photo and asking the for an opinion. Okay, so from like the photo here, some students um, uh, will think about the game or stacking the bricks, uh, like building blocks, some kind of structure, or they wanna <laughs> push or remove the block. Okay. <laughs> That's quite an aggressive move. Mind motor development. Hmm, interesting. Okay. Um, anyone else wanna join? Maybe 10 more seconds. 10. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's fine. Um, so the purpose of me showing you this photo is um is related to this course, of course, uh, because the data structure course is actually like one of the major building blocks that um that you need to know in the com in computer science field or computer engineering. Um, I know that you guys have um, taken algorithm before. That one is also a core course 
in the computer engineering, computer science field. Um, but after you know all the algorithms, which is basically you know the instructions or the thought process on how you um, you learn how to write the program. Now that you know how to write the program, know all the instruction, you know how to write the, the C program, you need to know how to structure it so that your program can run and work efficiently. That's why um, I think this photo um, is really related and that's why I put in as like the very first slide for this class, right? Okay, so, um, so in today's lecture, this is the agenda of my talk during the morning. Um, I will start with the syllabus and then I will quickly review the C. Hopefully you don't forget the knowledge in C yet. Um, if you do, then it's a good time to kind of dust it off, right? And then we will dive right into the intro to the data structure um, part. All right, at this point, am I talking too fast? Just let me know so that I can adjust my speed. <laughs> Uh, all right, next I'm gonna share the, uh, what is it? I'm gonna share the syllabus. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, so here's the syllabus. I already shared that on the line group. Um, so there are two instructors, uh, Professor uh, Natasha, Natasha. <laughs> Uh, and um, this is her email, the way of another way of communication besides the line. And this is me. Uh, my email is right here. And this is our TA, uh, Pitam. Pitam. Yeah, Pitam. His email. And this is the class time and the lab time. So we pretty much will, you know, get to see each other all day <laughs> from 10 uh, until in the afternoon. And the main part that I wanna show you is the student learning outcome for this course. So um, in this course, I'm gonna, we're gonna explain to you the basic principles uh, of data structure, you know, like all the characteristic, uh, characteristics and uh, descri describe their characteristics and generate correct predictions of their behavior in particular situations. Right, and um, you will know how to evaluate, select, and implement the appropriate data structures um, and associated algorithm. So basically, um, when you are thrown with the problem, when you're given the problem, you will know which is the right data structure to use to implement your program. That's like the gist of the second, the second point. And then the third is uh, related to when it comes to really applying, uh, really coding. Okay. Uh, so these are the main student learning outcomes. And um, in case you're interested to read more, these are the main references that will be used throughout this class, right? So first is the book uh, of uh, data structures using C. Um, and the second bullet point is the Mathematica, which is the main tool that we'll be using during the lab, right? But we'll talk more about that later in the afternoon. Right, and here's the ultimate learning outcome. Uh, so mainly the three modules. So the first modules will be focusing on the linear data structures. The second module, um, the focus is on uh, explaining the properties and the applications of the nonlinear data structures. And what are they? We're gonna talk about that uh, maybe, um, maybe in 15 minutes or 20 minutes, <laughs> all right. And then the last module, uh, you will, um, the outcome is that you will know how to select and uh, implement the appropriate data structures um, and associated algorithm, uh, which is what I already mentioned earlier. And here's the, the rubric. I'm not gonna go in the detail since now that you all have, uh, have the file, you can take a look at it because there are quite a bit of, text in here, alrighty. And moving on, here's also the great part. Um, if you have any question on this part, you can reach out to us accordingly, alrighty. But um, 
hopefully we can all do well in this semester and hope that at the end of the semester, you know how to, you know what the, what are the different data structures and how to, um, how to pick which one and when to pick which one to use for your program. That's like, that's like, like the goal of this class. So I hope that you can achieve that. And um, all right, so we have three modules as mentioned earlier. Um, so this is the detail of the first module. We will have uh, four labs and that accounts for 15%. We'll have a quiz here and there and um, all your work will be put in the portfolio and that will be counted towards your grade as well. And we have the exam for the first module. Um, second module is pretty similar. The pretty much like the same convention, same style as the first module. And the last module, this is the part where you will be um, really put your hands to work like coding and stuff when it comes to, you know, really applying the data structure. So we have the project, uh, you will have to work on some kind of application. And again, we still have the portfolio, All right? No questions so far. If you have um, any question at any point or I'm talking too fast, uh, don't, don't feel bad to interrupt me. I don't mind that at all, right? Um, what else? And here's some um, tentative, the course schedule. Uh, so like for each week, these are what will be covered. And um, if there is any update, um, we'll let you know, right? So that's it for the syllabus on the portfolio. Um, I thought I'd like uh, Dr. Madisha. Yes. Um, so a student uh, want to know more about the portfolio? Portfolio? Um, like, I guess like more detail on what to be included in the portfolio because it's part of the grade. Okay, the portfolio is all about that. You, if you have finished your lab, right? And you are programming codes, right? You may have to put it on, on your portfolio, just that. On the ship, so maybe you have to put your comments, you have to put the explanation that you understand about your program. If you want to show us to get the more score, that's all about the portfolio. The portfolio will be used for you. Maybe after your graduation, maybe you can show this to your employer, right? Uh -huh. That might be important to you later, but for me, I think the portfolio will um, show you about your understanding about this course. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, it's uh, the idea is that it's like a GitHub page or your own website where you will put all your work there and you kind of clean it up, make it look nice and put in some explanations so that like uh, when you publish, your work out there and anyone in the world could come and take a look and if they're interested they could contact you or stuff like that so that's the idea of the portfolio did i answer your question yeah and you also have some kinds of the 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 award for the good explanation mm -hmm. or the nice if you thing. have the to pack participate well in the class, like you all, both of us can give you the star for you individually, mm -hmm. right? And you have to collect the stars. Let me say star for easy speaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, oh, and um, so uh, module two exam, uh, I got a question about the quiz or exam on, the module, the second module? Oh, it has to be changed. Uh, we have just changed to um, the 5th of April in the afternoon. Mm, okay. Okay. Sorry, this one is uh, the, we have just changed okay. into the official, the, the formal schedule. Okay. Um, so thank you for pointing that out. Uh, we're going to update the um, this syllabus and then uh, we'll let you know. We'll share that on the on the line. And about the class attendance, are we are we <laughs> checking? Do we have to that into the score? No. Uh, not really. No. 
No, we don't. <laughs> well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we'll we'll let you know. All right. But I mean, technically, if you have class and you do not have to attend any, you know, event like today, then you're you're supposed to come to class. Because <laughs> why not? Right. All right. Does anyone have other questions on the on the syllabus? If not, then I'm gonna move on to the um, a quick review of C. Okay. All right, so for the this part, I will just like kind of skip through pretty quickly because um, I'm pretty sure that the knowledge in C is still fresh in your memory <laughs> since it was only last semester, right? Last semester. It was just last semester, so. <laughs> it's already gone. <laughs> no, we to break. Hopefully it's still there. Um, so let's take a look. Um, all right, so mainly the structure of the C program. Um, so C program will include a bunch of questions. And if you remember, so, um, well, you will have like the main function and that's like where the program will uh, like start the execution. But then in the main, the main, main program, like the main function doesn't really include it, everything. Otherwise, um, it will be like really large, really long and really hard to maintain. So it's better for you to break it down into several functions and each function will work um, on a really well-defined task and then return the value or whatever. So, um, so here's like the main structure of the program. You could see that there is a main function here and then it has like a bunch of functions. And um, I mean, you will also have uh, to include a bunch of libraries in the beginning. So that's it <laughs> for the structure of the C program. And now uh, when we delve, when we dive more into the, the, the C program, so there are identifiers and the keywords. So what are the identifiers? Uh, basically identifiers, according to this, it's a, a, a names given to the given to the program elements such as the variables, arrays, and functions, all right? Um, and for identifiers, there are like certain rules of the names that you can uh, give to the variables or the function. So um, I'm pretty sure that you are you got that down from the last class, right? So um, for the keywords, keywords is different from identifiers in that it's a name that you cannot use because it is reserved to do certain things. Uh, so let's take a look at this, um, this table right here. So these are all the names that you cannot use to name your variable because it's just not allowed. And even if it allows, it will be really confusing if you do so. So do not do it, all right? Okay, moving on. Uh, so for the basic data types, so as you know that um, there are four main data types in C, uh, char, this is for character, there's int for integer, float, and the double, and these are all for the, the floating points or those numbers that has the, the precisions, and these are the range. Okay, so for character, just like the name, it's mainly used to store the characters. And for integer, is used to store the integer numbers. And float and double are all for the floating points, but then the range will be different, all right? One, one of them is larger. Can you tell me which one has a larger range between uh, float and double? Double. 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 Okay. That's an, an, you want, want to confirm which one has a larger range? <laughs> yes, it's a double. Double. Yeah. Okay, that's right. 
Um, I just saw like uh, one that ask about the application review. Um, we'll come back to it um, later, right? Since like we're on a roll right now on a uh, review of C, okay? Um, if I don't, then remind me at the end. Thank you. Um, oops, okay, next. Uh, um, these are like more details about the range of different data types, which um, we can, you can like look at it in your own time. Um, all right, so variables and constant. So variables is what you will have to declare, uh, declare a lot in your program, right? Um, so a variable, the real definition is that it's defined as a meaningful name given to hold a value, given to store a data, and you will store that in a, in a computer memory. All right, so um, in C, uh, there are two kinds of variables. One is a numeric variables and another is a character. So numeric is used to store the integer values or a floating point number. So the name is quite self-explanatory right there. It's a uh, numeric, so you store the number. And for the character variables, you use it to store a, uh, a characters, right? So, um, so here's just a quick example, which I think you have done that a lot in the last semester. So this is how you declare the integer variable. If a float, this is for character, so char, great. And this is for double and unsigned short. So nothing special for this page. And some more, <laughs> some more example. And next, so for the constant, the main difference uh, compared to the integer variable or the character variable is that, um, well, for the variables, you, you can change it throughout the program. You can uh, update the value and whatnot. But when it comes to constant, the value remains the same throughout the program, okay? So the way that you do that is you declare C-O-N-S-T in the front and then the data type, uh, the, the type of the variable, which is a float, and then you assign the value. Okay. Um, next. Uh, well, now let's quickly take a look at the C program. So this program is pretty simple. It has nothing. Uh, this program, what it does is it will only print the this welcome to the world of C. So you will need to include the necessary, necessary library that you need, which this one, you need um, standard input output. Okay, so you have to have that. And then you declare the main function and in there you print something and then you return something. And the reason that you need to return is because the type of your function is an int. So you just need to return something. Otherwise it will throw you an error. So that's it. Okay, so this is a really simple C program, but I know that you have written uh, a more complicated looking program at this point. All right, so now let's take a look at the operators and the expression. So for the uh, operations first, so these are like uh, the main operations. So there are uh, multiply. So you use this operator for multiplication. The syntax looks like this. Right, for division, pretty similar. You use like a, a forward slash for addition, subtraction, and the modulus. So this is um this is how they look like for the arithmetic operators. Right. And for other things, um, so these are for the comparison purpose. So less than, greater than, and less than or equal, greater than or equal. Okay, and this is the equality operator where you'll be using a lot when you use like the condition to compare something, to compare the numbers. And uh, for the logical, um, this is logical and uh, or and the not, which is, you know, just flip uh, the meaning from zero to one and one to zero. The simple as that. Okay. Um, well, for the program, I think I think I can skip this part because it's probably pretty simple, uh, too simple for you. 
All right, now let's talk about the control statement. So uh, the control statement is mainly dealing with the decision of the program. So um, for for any instruction to be executed, it has to it has to satisfy uh, certain things. If it doesn't satisfy the condition, then that statement won't be um, executed, right? So um, the decision control statement would include the if or if else, and then if else if or switch case. So um, if the condition of if is satisfied, then the line next to it will be executed and then and then done. If not, then it will skip to the else. Or if it doesn't have else, then it would just you know go to the next line and it will just like ignore whatever that's in the if right that's like the main idea of the control statement all right um as the flow chart let's take a look here so we have like the the test expression so if the condition is satisfied or it's true then you move on to perform the statement in the block one right here. If it's not, then you just completely ignore this block, false, then skip right to the statement X, All right? So this is um, the flow chart of the if statement. And for the else, um, if you, this is like the if part, if it's true, then you perform this route. If not, then you just go right to the, this part, All right? And then, um, whether you do the if or the else at the end, you will go ahead and then perform the statement X. So this is according to the block of code over here, All right? Let me check the chat real quick if anyone's, okay, no one said anything. <laughs> all righty. Um, all right, if else if, um, well, we have, uh, we know if, we know um, even else. So now we have if and then else if, right? So, well, Look at the code first. So this is like the first condition. If this is not satisfied, then you go ahead and then you check the else if. And there could be like multiple else ifs along the way. So basically uh, the program will have to like check every condition. Whenever it doesn't like satisfy one, it has to like keep checking. And if none is satisfied, then you have to, you know, there's no choice, you have to check the else. And then right at the end, you see the statement Y. Uh, so when we compare to the flow chart here, all the arrows will be pointed toward the statement Y, right? So that's like, that's, that's like the flow of the, um, of the block of code right here. Right, what else do we have? You have the switch case. Um, this is also pretty similar to the if and else if. Uh, so you take a look right here. There are a lot of the, the conditions. If it's satisfied, then you go ahead and then perform a certain statement. And then you go right to the last statement. So you don't really have to waste time checking every condition, right? So it's like a shortcut. This is done, okay. Right to the statement X. If not, then you have to keep checking the next case, next case, next case until one is satisfied. All right. So make sure that you have like all the uh, think about like all the all the conditions that you have, and um, if none is working, then you need to have like the default. Right. Right. Okay. Um. So. For iterative statement, the main idea of the iterative statement is that um, um, the execution will be repeated, okay, until a specified expression becomes false, okay? And uh, the types of the iterative, iterative statements include the while loop or do while or the for loop. Um, so let's look at the flow chart again. This one is for the while loop. So we have the statement X right here, and then we get into the Y uh, while, and we have like a certain condition. So this is the, the while loop part, and then the condition will be, you know, check. Um, so while it is still, um, while the condition is still satisfied, the statement, uh, 
block will keep will be executed repeatedly, repeatedly until the condition doesn't match anymore. And then at that point, we will break out of the while loop and then execute the statement Y. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Is everyone still with me? <laughs> Hopefully. Okay, all right. Um, so moving on to the do while loop. Uh, can anyone tell me what's the main difference between while loop and the do while loop? Any volunteer, any representative of the class? Okay, right, any other answer? Or are you all like plus one here? You all agree with the, you all agree with the first answer? <laughs> okay, so plus one, plus, 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 okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So do while the main difference from the while loop is that it will do first and then you will perform the the, the while loop part. Okay. Um okay, calm down. All right, next. Um how about the for loop? What is the main idea of the for loop? Can someone like um, write a brief definition uh, of the for loop, how you understand it in your own words? Okay. So one, a uh, classmate answered that four uh, is that uh, you will have to set the times of the loop. Okay. Okay, can define the start point and end point. All right. Any other answer? Or plus one? Set condition for loop. Um, can you elaborate on that? What do you mean by um set condition for loop? Like for the for loop to be executed, it has to have some kind of condition or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, there's uh, I'm just gonna read it out loud. So one answer is uh, unlike other loops, for loop is more standard in terms of definition and simple to write. In other loops, we have to look inside the code block for increment or decrement behavior. Hmm. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> uh, I'm not too sure if I uh, if that like really registered. Um, hmm. Okay, let's let's look at more answers. So um, first value, set first value, set condition, and how the value will change. Okay, and another uh, say that it's beneficial when we need to work with the counting variable inside an iteration. Well, there is um, already some answers that are on point. Because, uh, well, when you look at the while loop, you do not really know when it ends. Like you actually know when it ends, if it meets certain, um, meet certain condition, and then you will break out the, the of the while loop or the do while loop. But for the four, you know beforehand how many iterations that you are gonna um, that the program will execute because like you have that like four, um, like let's say a variable i equals to something, and then you set i to certain number, and you know that um, i will increment or decrement, and then at one point it will get out of the for loop. So um, the main gist of the for loop is that like, you know uh, where it starts and where it ends. And then within the for loop, the execution will be done repeatedly and the, the variable will be updated. My, like, right? You wanna add anything for the for loop part? It's okay. No. Um, okay. Yeah, so actually like all the answers that you gave are, are correct. Uh, so, uh, one that say you can start the, you can define the start point and end point that is correct. And, um, the one that say set the first, set the first value, set the condition and how the value changes. I think this one is also pretty on point. Yep. And yeah. <laughs> All right. So any questions so far? Right, no, I mean, I think they're really, they really got the C programming down, like really, really good at C programming. So that's good to, that's good to see. All right, next, um, break and continue statement. So, okay, let's go back. So when do you use the break, uh, the, the break statement? Like, give me a quick answer. <laughs> When do you use the break statement? And when do you use the continue statement? And where do you use that? Do you use it in the for loop? Or do you just use it anywhere in the program? Any answer? Okay. And where, where do you, when do you use break? When do you use continue? You need a break. <laughs> break to exit from the loop, you mean? Okay, right, right. Continue when you want to skip some loop, okay. Yep, that's, uh, yeah, that's right, all right. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so, um, so you use the break statement to terminate from the loop, uh, just terminate from the loop. Yeah, to just get out of the loop, right? And uh, continue when you just, you know, just wanna just keep going. <laughs> and like, just do nothing in there and then go out and then print F, print print this, um, I mean, this line. No, we are not going to print uh, five. Oh, this one? Yeah. For continue, you have to skip for some specific. Mm, okay, so it prints like everything. Oh yeah, print everything when um when i is five, then 
you just like go right back to the here to the for loop and then um, ignoring the printf line. Use use in the loop, break to exit the loop and continue to skip to another loop. Yeah, that's right. All right. Um, next, um, let's see how much. Uh, for the, I have to add on about the, the definition of the continue, right? For the continue, this is different to the, the case of the, the break. Like the break, it just simply exit of the loop, right? But for continue, you have to exit that that uh, iteration, and then you have to check for the condition. If the condition holds true, you have to continue the loop. But if the condition is false, you have to go out of the loop, and you not go to work uh, to to do the iterate iteration again. That is the difference of the break and continue, right? For for in this um in this slide you can see that if i is equal to five, right, you continue. So totally this case the 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 loop will not do. And um the most important is that you have to be careful about the 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 instruction right after the if cause here. So. Uh, for the continue, you have to skip all the instruction here and go out of the for loop and then check for the condition. If the condition holds true, you can continue with the instruction inside the loop. And that's all. But for the, the, the oops. But for the case of the break, right? You can just simply go out of the loop and then return zero and then stop the iteration. And that is the difference between the break and continuum statements. Okay, any question? Okay, actually, this is, okay. When I, when I try to teach about the break and continuum statement, I always, uh, let refer to the case of the boyfriend and girlfriend relationship. You know, for the break, right? The break is just a break, right? If you don't like your boyfriend or your girlfriend, and then you break, break is break. You will not uh bad again, but for the continue, right? When you okay, you for the continue, right? You need to stop the relationship and then you go and check again, he's good, okay. So we'll go back. That is a continue. Okay. Something like that. <laughs> this is a, I'm not sure whether this is a good explanation about uh, the example of the break and continue, but normally I will explain like this. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I think that's a that's a relatable analogy, <laughs> Rel <laughs> relatable example. Okay. So break like you. This is uh, the good time to have a five or ten minutes break, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we come to the break segment. All right. Okay. We'll, we'll take like a take a five. We'll meet just five minutes. Okay, it's up to you. <laughs> okay, uh, let's meet again around like 11.30. It Alrighty, okay. And uh, do, 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 where is it? Okay, let me share the screen again. <laughs> okay. All right. Can you see my screen? Can you confirm to me that you can see the screen, please? Yeah, actually, okay, cool. All right, now we got to the function, okay? Um, well, you know how to write fun function, I'm pretty sure. But uh, from my experience in my very first program as a freshman, in uh, in Bang Mod, when I were in your position, actually, um, I didn't really like writing function at the time. I felt like it was a headache, but uh, over time, I learned that function is really helpful because you do not want to dump everything into the main program. Because when it comes to maintaining the code or debugging or like testing your work, if one thing happens to mess up, then it would cause a domino effect. I mean, the entire program could be a mess afterwards. So you wouldn't want that to happen. That's like a really undesirable scenario. 
So um, whenever possible, um, if you know a well-defined task, you would want to break it down into a function and um, you would want it to like be separate from the ma main program, right? So the main program um, can call the function accordingly. Uh, so how it works, uh, let's take a look at this picture right here. So you can see that there is a, a main program and this is where the first function is uh, called. So when this line got executed, you will jump right to the function and you work in that function. And if there is any return value, return that and you come back to the main program and that's it. That's like the main idea of the, of the function. Okay, so, uh, well, this is, the, this is the case where you have like the main function and then there is uh, a separate function, func1 right here. And then in the func1, it calls func2 and in func2, it calls func3 and so on. So uh, when this one is done, you return the value. So it comes back to here, execute the rest and then return the value back here and so on and so forth, right? Um, okay, uh, well, the gist of this page is just to tell you why the functions are important and why is it necessary and encouraged for you to write. Um, uh, so the idea is that it's because the function can uh, facilitate or help you uh, to just so that like your task can be tested separately. Right, and um, it's easier to maintain and test, uh, you know, in a long run, rather than like putting everything into like one, uh, one big function. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. I actually kind of cover this um, according to my experience. Um, do you guys like to write function or not really? Do you have the concept of function down? Can you share that in the chat, please? Like, how well do you understand the function? Something, something, say something. <laughs> okay, okay, so six to seven out of 10, that's not bad. Uh, what is like the concern when it comes to writing the function? What is the thing that still confuse you? Can you share that? Was it related to how to return or what? Anyone can join by the way. <laughs> I like this function. I used to, I like to use function too. It also helps to make your code more readable. Okay. Mm -hmm. So for those that got the concept of function down, that's cool. I comment you on that. But for those who are still not, you know, like not so sure about the function, uh, if you want, you can like share why, uh, why this concept is still confused for you. You can share that, I'm not gonna bite. <laughs> like how to use it to, uh, to reduce the work, but, oh, okay, okay. That could happen, especially if your code kind of spans too long when the code becomes more complicated. Um, well, I, I think I understand that sometimes like I try to break things down into function, but wait a sec, wait a sec. Okay. So yeah, where where am I? Um yeah, so um well, if you get like more experience in coding, you will, you will actually enjoy writing the function and uh, in the long run, it will, it will help you rather than uh, causing a burden to you, right? Um, well, during the class, I think you will get to, and yeah, during this class and during the four year 
of your time here in uh, in Bangor, you will you'll be better in 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 coding for sure. All right, so don't worry about it. Um, another comment say that I face difficulties dividing a big program into smaller functions rationally. Yeah, I face that problems too. So don't worry. <laughs> okay. Um. All right. So well, I we can skip this example and go right into the passing parameters to function. All right. So there are two main ways to pass the parameters to the function. The first is called by value and another is called by reference. So anyone can like give me a quick um quick answer on the difference between the two. Call by value versus call by reference. Uh, what can you elaborate on that? Uh, for the first answer that says reference can change the value in the main function. So what uh, can you clarify on this part, please? Sorry about the noise in the background. There was uh, some minor disturbances going on <laughs> a few minutes ago, but it, it's all good now. All right, another answer is say that call by value gives function the actual value while call by reference gives the address. Oh, actually, I think that's, that answer is actually on point. Yeah, so call by value, yes, what happens is that you, well, the call to function basically uh, create a new variable that copies, right? That create a new variable created a new variable that copies the value and then yes. like does anything to the value. But uh, if it's a call by reference, then you give the address and whatever action that you do to the address, you just change, make a change to the value right then and there in the address. So, uh, <laughs> okay, can I change my answer now? Miss type, yeah, you can change the answer, sure. All right, uh, so I think, so the answer that I read earlier, um, I will reread it again because uh, I think this is a good definition. So call by value gives function the actual value, that's right, while the call by reference gives the address. So, um, well, which one is a faster method? Like for the big program, when you deal with a large amount of data, uh, using the call by value or call by reference, which one will be faster? Okay. Does anyone have like different opinion? Okay. Who thinks that uh, call by value is faster? Anyone, or is it because like, or is it because now in the, in the chat, everyone says call by reference. So. <laughs> okay. All right, <laughs> sure. Okay, yeah, so the answer is call by reference is faster because um, for call by value, you have to, the program will have to spend time of like you don't it's kind of non-trivial uh it's you probably cannot really catch that if the program is small uh you feel like it's also fast but well when you really deal with the big program it makes a lot of difference right so uh it's encouraged to use the call by reference for a large program and a large data i mean but it's kind of it's gonna give you a headache because, well, there'll be a concept of the pointer and a concept of the address and everything, which could be confusing, right? Um, 
So, uh, okay, so this is an example of how call by values look like. So if you take a look at this function over here, you directly, uh, the function directly accepts int n, right? And um, as an argument, right? And in the main function, you just pass num, this variable. So this is a call, when, when you use a call by value approach, this is how you write it. Uh, this is how you write it, all right? Uh, but when it's a call by reference, the difference is that you need to have an asterisk over here. So um, now that you see that, well, according to this function definition, you see that it has, it accepts an address. So in the main function, whenever you make a call to this function, you have to add the ampersand. Uh, and this will pass the address, like pass the reference to the function, All right? Um, so when you use this approach, also be careful because whatever change that you make will just, just do it right at the address. So um, it could cause harm if you are not careful. But if you use like a call by value approach, if you make any change, it doesn't really like, it doesn't really make the change to like the the original value in in the in the original address. Does that make sense? You want to add anything? Or is it okay? Okay. If no one um have any comments or concern, I think. Uh oh. And then the pointer. <laughs> All right, so pointer, just quickly, the syntax, you need to have the asterisk. We, we are going to go into detail about the pointers in the part of the, the link list. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so in the week that we cover the link list, you'll be using uh, pointer quite a bit. So if you're not really... Uh, if you're not so sure about the pointer, it's a good time now that you start to, you know, kind of revisit the concept again and practice, right? Uh, okay. So um, we got the review C part down. Now we're gonna go to the intro to data structure. Finally, uh, let me change. Uh, Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so intro to data structure. Right. So um okay. As I said earlier, I'm gonna emphasize it again that we have three modules. So the first module we will cover uh, the linear data structures part. And then the second module, the focus is gonna be on the nonlinear data structure and what they are, uh, we'll see that in a bit. And then in the last module, um, the focus will be more on the application, application side, right? So, um, in case you don't know, uh, this is the, the slides that Dr. Nadesha just updated. And we use this color. What, what is the color name again? Oh, Viva Magenta. Yeah, Viva this Magenta. Pantone this year. Uh -huh. This is a Pantone for this year. The name is a Viva Magenta. You can search on a Google Pantone, P-A-N-T-O-N-E of, uh, of this year, 2023. Yeah. Anyways, that's on a tangent. So uh, the overview, um, I will first introduce you to what data structures is and uh, what they are. Okay, different, uh, different classes of it. And what are the operations? The data type, some algorithm, and uh, different approaches to design the algorithm, whether it's a top-down or bottom-up. And then the control stru structures using algorithm, some big O, time and space complexity. All right, um, hopefully that I can do it within the time, within the amount of time that I have. <laughs> All righty, 
Okay, uh, let's start with the basic term terminology. Okay, so, um, so first of all, when it comes to writing a program, any good program uh, means that it can run according to whatever specification that was given. Uh, so it can run correctly. It can, um, you can, it's easy to read and understand, meaning that if you have a team of many people, when a new member that joins the team, they read your code, they read uh, the, the flow of your program and they can understand and then can be on board. It doesn't take time to like understand, right? Uh, the code should be easy to debug. The program should be easy to debug and also um, modify, uh, easy to modify, okay? Um, but you don't want to care about the correctness of your program only. Um, if the code spans, you know, becomes like really large, the teams is getting bigger, growing larger, the code, of course, um, is expected to be much longer, maybe spans like, I don't know, tons of functions and hundreds of lines of code. So, um, you you don't want it to just give the correct result, but you at this point you will care about the efficiency as well, right? You don't want the code that gives you the correct result, but you have to wait three hours just to print something or just to give you some number. You would want things to be much faster, and you can do that through a better plan and better data structure, right? Um. So, okay. So a program is considered to be efficient if it uh, needs less time, if, if it executes in less time with um, you know, minimum memory space, because although we're talking about the terabyte or uh, terabyte is not really, uh, well, in during my days, we gigabyte is already like a lot and a fancy term, but now we're not talking about gigabyte anymore. Anyways, my point is that although we kind of have a lot of you know, memory space, but um, it's still not infinite. So um, with the limit amount of time and the space that we have, we want to make sure that the program can handle all of that, right? And um, so that's when, that's why the concept of data management comes into play uh, when you deal with the complex task, right? Uh, so the concept of the data management will include activities like the data collection, how you collect the data, and the how you organize the data into an appropriate structures, and um, develop and maintain routines for quality uh, assurance, and so on. <laughs> okay, next. Uh, well, so after all that I said, uh, what I want to emphasize is that um, with the good data structure, your program can um, work efficiently with, you know, uh, can run fast and can also fit in the memory, limited amount of memory that you have, right? Uh, so this class will focus on, you know, a particular way, uh, teaching a particular way to store and organize the data in the computer so that it can be used efficiently, right? Um, all right, so examples of data structures include the arrays, linked list. You will uh, learn about arrays actually next week. It's so soon, too soon than you think. And then we also have the queues, stacks, binary trees, and hash tables. All right. Um, okay. And data structures, well, apl is applicable in a bunch of areas, right? Um, from a low level all the way to the application level. So uh, like uh, numerical analysis, AI, even in the database management, simulation, and the graphics, okay? Um, all right, so, uh, well, we have a bunch of, not a bunch, a few data structures, but it doesn't mean that, um, it doesn't mean that you can use a certain data structure for every kind of problem. So, uh, for example, well, if your data is about the network, you wouldn't want to use uh, trees or array. Well, you can force to use that, but is it efficient? Probably not as good as graphs, right? Well, if your data is a uh, hierarchical base, you would want to select the trees because it better fits your data. And if it's simply like a, a database, well, you can just, you know, use the array. You don't have to use like a graphs because it's way more complicated unnecessarily. 
Right. Um, so, okay. Uh, all right. So the goal of the All right, so all right, so the goal of a program or a software, well, is not just to uh, perform calculations or operations. It's not about whether you can like like get the requirement and do that, but you also need to take into account uh, whether you can store and retrieve the information fast enough. Okay, um, this is on par with the example that I gave earlier, you wouldn't want your program to execute just one problem, but takes you like half a day. You, it would be more desirable if the program can give you a result within 15 minutes, right? Um, all right. Uh, okay, so here's like the steps that will need to be taken. Uh, when selecting the data structure to solve the problem. So first of all, you need to analyze the problem. Okay, so what is the problem basically? What operations that you need to have? Do you need to insert the new data? You have to delete the data. Does it include the searching of any data item? So the problem must be clear, right? And then after you understand the problem, you already analyze it, then now you can take a look at the resource constraint, how much resource that you have have how much time that you have, right? And then after that, after the first and the second uh, point here are down, then you can select the data structure that best meets the requirements that you got, right? Uh, okay. Does everyone follow me so far? Am I going too fast? <laughs> Just wanna keep checking every now and then. If I'm too fast, if I'm not too fast, then type something like it's good or pace is good or whatever. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, I would consider this as a positive emoji. Okay, it looks positive to me. All right, so, okay. So next, um, do you, okay, now, do you remember the first picture that I showed an hour ago? <laughs> I think it's an hour ago. It was the first picture in the first slide that I showed you. That is meant to uh, give you an idea that this class will be uh, teaching you about the building blocks of the program, uh, building, blo building blocks of, you know, your foundation in computer engineering, right? So um, any program that has an, a bad data structure and improper data structures, maybe it gives you the result, but maybe it's not, it's not efficient, or maybe it would even lead to a wrong result. So um, as a good programmer, it is mandatory to use the appropriate data structures, especially now that you're, now that you will learn about this course. So uh, it's now mandatory for you to choose the most appropriate data structures for your program. Okay. Um, uh, this is, this page is merely the definition of the data. So, okay, I'll just go through it quickly. So the data refers to a value or a set of value. So value is a um, simple, value is like any value, okay? Like a number of a students, uh, name of an employee, but if it's a set of value, then, um, now it's not like just one value. So um, I think this example is good. Uh, well, for example, uh, student name could be further divided into sub items. So the name could include the first name, middle name, and the last name. So this right here is a set of values, all right? Uh, next. Okay, another term that I wanna introduce is uh, a record. So record is a, now it's a collection of a data item. So um, for example, well, the name, the address, course, whatever, is like a record of a student, 
So one student, you would wanna acquire the value of uh, like that. What are they? What are the person's name? Where does the person live? What are the courses that that the student uh, take in the semester? And what are the scores that that student got from tests? So this is considered a record, right? And now a file. File is a record. Is well, value is the smallest, and then a set of values is bigger. And now there's like a record, which is even bigger and file is the biggest because now file is a collection of the related records. So the example here is pretty clear. Uh, let's say there are 60 students in the class. So in total, we have like 60 records of the student and this, all of them, uh, record of all 60 students are is considered a file, will be stored in a file, not considered a file, sorry. Right, so um, all these, all the related records will be stored in a file, right? Okay, and now let's take a look at the different classes of data structure. So there are two classes, a uh, primitive and a non-primitive, right? So the, okay, so the primitive data structure uh, is a fundamental data types. And examples are integer, uh, character, boolean, for example. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know what else to say because it's like, uh, yeah, it's uh, just primitive. Like, yeah, primitive. Primitive. It's just primitive. Yeah, it's like a beginning, yeah. original. Yeah, you cannot break it down any further. All right. But uh, if it's a non primitive, so non-primitive is where you use the primitive data structure to create it. Did I, did I say it correctly? Hopefully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, for example, in a linked list, you can use array to implement the linked list or you can use... Uh, huh? We can use array to implement the list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use array to implement the, the linked list. Um, and in the linked list, you will actually like use the primitive data structures in your implementation. Right. Did I confuse you already? Hopefully not. Right. No one said anything, so I think I'm good. <laughs> okay, next. Um, all right. So more about the non-primitive data structure. Uh, it can be further classified into linear and nonlinear data structure. So the linear one uh, examples are arrays, linked lists, stacks, and queues. Okay, um, I will have like an overview of all of them in a bit, uh, but mainly linear data structure, uh, well, different, all the elements uh, will have a linear relationship. So uh different elements well, i should put it this way uh each element will have a linear relationship among each other right um or could be in terms of the memory location or in terms of link okay so um if you think about the array each array uh the memory location is like kind of in sequence so that's like a that shows you a linear relationship. But in terms of link, if you think about the linked list, each element are linked together, like just like one by one. So, uh, so linear relationship can be seen um, as like a, from the link that they have among each other. All right, any comments? Okay, I actually keep keep my eyes keep my eyes on the comments. So if you have any comments, feel free. Like it doesn't it will distract me, but it's a good distraction, so don't worry. <laughs> um, next, uh, okay. So uh, some examples of a nonlinear structures include the trees and grass. So if you think about the tree, um, the root spans to different branches, and then a lot of branches later on down you know, down the line. And then at the end, there are a bunch of leaf nodes. So it doesn't really look like linear anymore because it's all around the place. Um, graphs is uh, 
probably even more clear to you because all the nodes could be, you know, connected. So, um, so the relationship right there uh, isn't maintained in a like a linear data structure anymore. All right. Uh, okay, now is some quick overview of different data structure. So for the array, so array is a collection of uh, similar data elements. So like right here, if you declare a variable int marks as an array of the size uh, 10. So you could see that all the 10 elements here will be of the type integer. All right, you cannot have like one that's a char or character right here. And then over here, there's float. It doesn't work that way. If you declare int marks of the size 10, then you basically already allocate 10 for all 10 integers that are of the same name, which is marks. Okay, all right, next. Um, all right, so array. Uh, the thing is arrays are of the fixed size um, because for example, right here, you already define, um, you already allocate like 10. So the size has gotta be this number. It cannot be like 12 on the fly. And um, the data elements are stored in a contiguous memory locations. So um, the flaw uh, of arrays being, you know, have having to be contiguous is that whenever you want to delete or insert anything, it could be kind of difficult to do because if you delete one, you may have to shift the rest. And um, if you, you cannot shift one, you have to shift a bunch. So that could, that couldn't be, uh, that might not be convenient. And so yeah, it could be time consuming. So um, linked list is introduced will come into play here. So linked list is a dynamic data structure. Um, so, um, so with the linked list, you do not have to define how many elements that you want to have beforehand. You can keep adding it on the fly, all right? Because it's it's really dynamic. Uh, all you need, uh, the, main, the main gist of the linked list is that each element will have, of course, the value and it will need to have a pointer that's pointing to the to the next element in the list, all right? So when you want to add a new element, you just create a new node, you add the value, you create a pointer, and you direct it to link to uh, what in the list, all right? And when you want to delete anything from delete element from the linked list, you simply take it out, but make sure that you uh, point the connection of whatever remains in the linked list to like the right node. So that's the main idea of the linked list. So this is how the linked list looks like, right? So the last node in the list uh, will have a null pointer because it doesn't point to anywhere, right? So this is the head and this is the last in the list. So it's null pointing to nowhere. All right, and next, the stack. So uh, stack is also a linear data structure. And um, well, the, the main thing about stack is that, uh, remember that it's a last in first out. Think of a stack as like a stack of stuff. You keep adding it. So the first will be the one at the top and that will be the first to get out, okay? So, um, um, well, you can use the array or even the linked list to implement the stack. Uh, this one shows you uh, the implementation of a link uh, oh, of a stack by way of array. All right. So the one right here is the top because it's being added last. Right. And um, mm. well, yeah, as I said earlier, top is what you need to keep an eye on. You need to have a variable that, uh, that uh, what is it? That keep track of where the top is, okay? Uh, we'll learn more about this later on. I mean, later in this semester, you will, when, uh, when the stack lecture comes around, you will be dealing it, with it a lot also in the lab. All right, uh, so the main operations of stack is a push 
pop and peep. So push is when you want to add a new element, you want to add it to the top of the stack. So you push it onto the stack. And when you want to remove the top, remove element from the stack, you have to pop it. So you pop the one at the top off the stack. And peep is when you want to return the, what is the top, where the top is, right? Without deleting it. So just peep. <laughs> right, next uh, queue. So queue is different from stack in that it's a first in, first out. It's just like you wait in line to get the food. You wait in line to get in the theater. So if you come first, you deserve to get served first. So it's just working like a queue in real life. Uh, so when you add a new element into the queue, it will be in the rear or like the last. And um, the other end, which is like the head, will be removed first. Okay. Uh, again, just like the stacks and queue, uh, uh, just like stacks, queues can be implemented using arrays or linked lists, right? Um, but for queue, uh, you need to keep track of uh, the front and also the rear or the back. So you probably need to have like a, a variable to keep an eye on those values, right? So that's like the main idea. Next is a tree. Uh, so tree now is a nonlinear data structure. So it consists of a collection of nodes that's arranged in a hierarchical order, right? So, um, uh, all right, so the simplest form of a tree is a binary tree. So the main idea of a binary tree is that uh, each node can branch out only two at most. And uh, you have to compare the value to the to the to that node. If the new value that comes in um, is less than the existing node, then it has to go to the left. If it's higher, then it has to go to the right. So that's like the the main convention of a binary tree, right? So uh, a binary tree will consist of root node and the left subtree and the right subtree. Okay. Um. Right. So this is how it looks like. Uh, so here's a new uh, root node right here, and this is the left subtree, and this is the right subtree. And if you just focus on this node, then right here is the subtree of this node. And this is like, uh, well, because it's only one node, so it's just like a child of this node, and this is a parent, right? Okay, uh, now for the graph. Graph is uh, uh, kind of similar to tree, but um, all the vertices could be connected. But tree, as you can see here, they're not like all connected. You need to have like some certain hierarchy in the tree, but for graphs, no, anyone can connect to each other. So it's a well collection of our vertices and the edges will make a connection among those vertices. Okay. Um, Alright. Yeah. So. Uh, okay. So in tree, nodes can have any number of children, but only one parent. Okay. But graph, it relaxes uh, this restriction. Yeah, I I kind of mentioned that already. So um, moving on to uh, operation on the data structures. So. Um, there are traversing, searching, inserting, and deleting. So traversing means that you can access the data, but uh, you access that data item once so that it can be processed. Okay, for example, if you just wanna traverse through like all the names and you wanna print those names. Okay, uh, let's imagine that this is, you know, the program about the data of uh, the, dealing with the data of the students. Right, so you traverse through all the data and you print, that's all. But searching is just like the name, you find the location of the data item. And if you find it, you can do something to it according to whatever requirement that you got, okay? But for inserting, this is when you wanna add a new data item. And delete is basically removing the data item from the collection. And we have more, we have also sorting and searching. So sorting is when you arrange the data item to certain kind of 
order, whether that be an ascending order or a descending order. And merging is when you want to merge, you want to combine uh, two set of data items together. All right. Um, now, how much time do you have left? Uh, okay, I think I can make it. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, hope you all are with me. All right. It's you, I'll, I'll let you have lunch soon. <laughs> so um, over here about the abstract data type. So, um, so abstract data type is how you look at a data structure by focusing on what it does, but uh, not the detail of how it does the job, right? So um, uh, I like the examples that's given here. Um, so stacks and queue. Um, well, you know that stacks has to be um, like last in first out. You don't care if you're gonna use the array or you're gonna use the linked list. So the idea of not having to know um, whether you use arrays or the linked list, but you know that it's a last in first out concept. And then you implement it. This right, uh, this is basically the, an idea of the abstract data type. Okay. Um, and uh, next. So data type, you already know uh, different data type of a variable. It could be int, char, float, double, right? So nothing fancy. Uh, but for abstract, this is pretty much repeating what I said earlier, uh, meaning that you don't really care about the implementation detail, how you're going to do it, but you care about um, whether like how it does, uh, uh, what it does, but not how it does the job, right? It's... All right, next. Okay, um, any questions so far? Just wanna check in. Anyone? Good, not good. Right. <laughs> okay. Um, do they already take algorithm? Mm. Or not really? Or is it like just C and then data structure, but not algorithm yet? Yeah. Okay. Um. Or right. I, I can keep going. Yeah. Okay. I can keep going a bit. Maybe I'll actually have to finish the goal. Yeah. Um, do you want me to like talk about algorithms as well or just jump right to the big O part? Oh, so you have to go into the of the time. Like, maybe you have to skip to the, the part of the big O. <laughs> All right. Um, well, so we're kind of short on time. So let me jump right to the big O part. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Mm. Okay, I want to talk about the big O, but I think I need to give like some context of the time and space complexity. Uh, we have until 12.30 or 12.30. We have to stop at 11.20. Uh, 20. 20. Uh, that's about five minutes left. So okay. maybe you can talk about a bit about the algorithms and then I will continue later about uh, the, the big O and the time, time, time space complexity later. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, in that case, I think it's better to just introduce to the approach in designing data structure yeah, than yeah, right. yeah. So um, well, we only have like a bit of time left, but uh, all that I want to say about the 
the approach to design data structure is that there are two kinds, so top down and bottom up. So top down, think about like, you have like the, the top node is like the root. So you, you know the problem and then you wanna divide the complex problem, the complex algorithm, you break it down further. So it's like from the top and then going down, right? And um, so this is actually like done a lot, a lot of like, uh, well, a lot of people use this way, but um, there is also like pros and cons Funds for each one. Uh, we'll take a look at the bottom up first. So, uh, uh, so bottom up is like the reverse of the top down. So from bottom up, you uh, basically design like different modules, like most basic concepts, and then you kind of proceed upward and then like merge them up to the top. Okay. Um, but then, well. Uh, but then the best scenario is that uh, you don't really want to use like purely top down or bottom up. In reality, you probably need to use both because um, when you use like purely the top down, then um, this is the problem that happens. So um, sub modules are analyzed in isolation. Okay, so without concentrating on any communication among the modules, uh, modules. So it basically ignore the concept of um, information hiding. So this is when you use just the top down. But when you use only the the bottom up, what happens is that um, it also caused the problem as well. All right. Uh, so um, in practice, you would wanna combine both. Okay. So. It entirely depends on the scenario. Yeah. I don't think I can like cover anymore. It's probably like already like too much information dumped into, you know, students all at once. But yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> right. Uh, well, I will stop sharing and then back to you. Like send back to me. <laughs> okay. I think um it is uh lunch time. And then we should stop here and then we will meet us again in the afternoon. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. We also have to eat. Okay. <laughs>